All right, YouTubers, what's going on? Thank you for subscribing. We've reached the 40K mark. We want some more. Please hit the subscribe button. We're going to talk about disappointing wide receivers, the Sunday night game, and much more right now on Fantasy Football Today. Well, what is the deal with these crummy wide receivers? Uh, they're scoring fewer points than Cordell Patterson. DeAndre Hopkins is not even in the top 20. Robert Woods isn't even in the top 40. Calvin Ridley, he's, he's, what's going on, Chris? He's like five yards down the field every time. What's going on here? Uh, some of those are concerning for sure. Yeah. Calvin Ridley, that Falcons offense just looks like a mess. You know, they're throwing 32% of their targets to their running backs. They are not pushing the ball downfield. And it's a concern that Matt Ryan just might not be good anymore. I mean, we saw it last season in the games that Julio Jones didn't play. He hasn't really been, I mean, he's been below 5% touchdown rate each of the last three seasons now. Um, I don't know, man. It's really concerning because Calvin Ridley led the NFL in air yards last season by yeah, a significant no, I, margin. I don't think it's a Matt Ryan problem. I, I think it's no Dirk Cutter. And it might be a, it might be an Arthur Smith problem. It might be, but you know, look, uh, they got time to turn around, obviously, but yeah, we'll get into him. We'll get into Tyree kill Stefan Diggs. A little disappointing so far. First, we're going to talk about this Packers 49ers game. Welcome, everybody. Hope you had a great Sunday. Hope you're ready for Monday Night Football. Should hey, be Adam, before one. we move on, yeah. can you send me the notes? Yes, I can. Thank you. But I think you pretty much know what, what we've got. Our I five don't. big topics. I sent you the topics. Our five yeah. big topics today are struggling wide receivers, Miles Gaskin, Kenny Galladay, Tyree kill and major takes going into week one that have changed and which ones we should remain patient on. We will have Jacob Gibbs join us in a little bit. I want to read you two quotes from Aaron Rodgers. All right. Hold on. I'm going to send you the notes. Control V. <laughs> All right. Two towers and Gibbs. Everybody's got their notes. Um, okay. The quote number one. My first thoughts in devising how I wanted to get us into field goal range was, how could I get 17 the ball? 17 being Devontae Adams. Yeah, I, I feel like the Niners should have anticipated that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that guy is good. And yeah. generally speaking, when a team has 35 seconds or 37 seconds to move the ball down the field, cover the, I mean, really, like the one good receiver they have. Yeah. Like, Marcus Valdez Scantling, Alan Lazard, they made plays yesterday. Robert Tunyon's fine, but like Devontae Adams is the only guy who moves the ball down the field for that team, really. Like, at least not in big play mode. And so, yeah, I don't. He's really good. Yeah, he had 18 targets in the game. The rest of the Packers receiving group, including the running backs, tight ends, they had 12. And that sounds about right. There were three throwaways, <clears throat> but yeah, you should have covered Devontae Adams. The second one was even more interesting. Rogers said, quote, how can you not be romantic about football? I, I guess, guess that was a pretty romantic game. <laughs> I I don't know. I don't. Okay, sure. I don't, I don't understand. It was a that's fine. Game. Yeah, I mean, it was, it it was, was a great a, game. Yeah, it was fun. Great Sunday. Really I good. Don't, I don't know about romantic, you know. Oh, oh yeah. It was fine. It was a fun game. Yeah, it was a really fun game. Let's do our takeaways from Green Bay 30 and San Francisco 28. Uh, give me your thoughts on the, you know, the, the Packers are the Packers. I don't know if you have anything to say about Rodgers. It really wasn't a great game for him. 22 fantasy points, but it's not like he played poorly or anything. Um, but the 49ers are much more interesting. And the run game, I mean, the, the run game, it's obviously directly related to the passing game because he had 40 pass attempts for Garoppolo, fourth most in his career. And Trey Sermon, of course, he scored. They always score a rushing touchdown, uh, but 10 carries, 31 yards, two catches, three yards, had the rushing touchdown, started in 38% of leagues. You're just your overall thoughts on the 49ers offense right now. I think Trey Sermon's the big loser from this game. Uh, I wrote my winners and losers column on, on today's FFT newsletter. And um, like he had a real chance here to get out of the doghouse, to work his way into potentially being the number one running back for the 49ers moving forward. And he wasn't good. In an offense where everyone looks good. Um, you know, it reminds me of Jarek McKinnon last season where he got a handful of opportunities, but just never really did enough with them to become more than, you know, the the third best back on that team when everyone was healthy. And I think that's probably where Trey Sermon's heading. Um, obviously, injuries 
will play a part in that, but I don't see him holding off Elijah Mitchell. I think Elijah Mitchell is going to be the lead back when he gets back, unless, you know, if he misses week four and Trey Sermon does have a good game, maybe that'll change things. But based on what we know right now, I think Elijah Mitchell's the the lead back for the 49ers when he's healthy. Yeah, I, I don't know if this offense can just give us any running back being good because Mitchell hasn't really been that good. You know, he was pretty good against Detroit. He was pretty bad against Philadelphia. Hasty wasn't very good in his audition last year. Um, McKinnon stunk. It's really last year was just Mostert and, and Wilson was good down the stretch. But the fact that they only gave him 10 carries when when Mitchell yeah. had 17 and 19 in two games, yeah. I think that tells you a lot. Um, but if they can't run the ball, and I looked at their leading rusher. I mean, this is just shocking. You don't see this very often. Their leading rusher had 31 rushing yards. So I said, all right, did that happen at all last year? There are actually three games last year where their leading rusher had 29 to 38 rushing yards. So they just had a terrible game running the ball. I think two of them were McKinnon, right? I'm pretty sure, yeah. Yeah. It was never Mostert. Uh, In those three games, they threw 41, 39, and 36 times. That's a lot for them. Two of those games they lost. They gave up 37 and 27 points. One of them was a blowout win. But the point I'm making here is I didn't really think this off. One of the reasons I didn't draft George Kittle is I did not think that this offense could sustain three pass catchers. They don't throw enough touchdowns. They don't throw enough in general. Now, their running game has gone to hell, so that could change. But um, And then I also thought Trey Lance wouldn't really be a great passer or whatever, but I don't know when he's going to start. Um, if they're throwing the ball 36 to 40 times, that changes things a little bit. And you had a very good game from Kittle. Of course, he didn't score. And a, and a touchdown from Ayuk. And, you know, a solid roll for Debo. He only had five. De- Debo week. dropped a touchdown. Yeah, and, and Ayuk, uh, I think, on the same drive had was close to yeah, that was um I, I think the Ayuk one I couldn't tell if that was a Jimmy Garoppolo issue or a Brandon Ayuk one because it was a slant into the uh, into the end zone and right Ayuk just didn't have his head turned around when Garoppolo yeah, threw no, it. That was such a drop. Oh I think he should have well yeah but yeah. either way um no I just don't know if that was Garoppolo making the wrong read or Ayuk not being ready for it but yeah. Yeah I just I don't know what to make of these three. Well, I mean, I have an opinion, but you give your opinion on, on the passing game here. Kittle, Samuel, Ayuk. Um, I think Kittle is still the lead target in this offense, despite not being that in the first two games. And actually, Debo Samuel did have more targets than him yesterday. But, uh, you know, part of that is just the the role as the extension of the running game that Debo has. I still think Kittle's an elite tight end. I still think he's certainly ahead of TJ Hawkinson. Um, you know, I think, you know, Hawkinson was coming for that spot, but week three probably changed that a little bit. And um, I think, like, I don't think Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel can be elite fantasy wide receivers in this offense, especially with George Kittle. But the bar for George Kittle being an elite tight end is very low. And I think he'll clear it pretty easily. As far as Samuel and Ayuk, I mean, it's a good sign for Ayuk that he was finally involved heavily. And that's a good sign moving forward. But you know, the the idea that some had before the season that both could be top 24 wide receivers, I think that's unlikely. Um, you know, maybe Samuel could be a top 25 to top 30 guy, and Ayuk, you know, more of a wide receiver three slash wide receiver four in the rankings. Um, but yeah, I don't think they're going to throw the ball 40 times every week for sure. Yeah, and if they have no running game, then they might have to, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, also they were, they were playing the Packers, but they've got Seattle and Arizona, their next two games. They might throw more than we've seen in, in any three game stretch. I wonder what the most pass attempts in the Shanahan era under in a three game stretch is. but, uh, all right. Anyway, anything on the Packers or shall we, uh, are we keeping AJ Dillon or is he droppable? I'd like to stash him. I mean, you saw with Alexander Madison this week, the, the value in stashing those guys, if you don't need to drop them. Um, so it depends on who you're trying to add. If you're, if you're desperate for, um, you know, Chuba, Chuba Hubbard, Chuba Hubbard, Chuba, Chuba Hubbard. Um, yeah, I would drop AJ Dillon for Chuba Hubbard. Um, if it's like Emmanuel Sanders, who I really, really like, you know, I think I'd be iffy on that one. Okay. Chuba Hubbard, by the way, you may only get one game out of Chuba Hubbard. We will get to the news and notes in a second. Let's talk about that newsletter. All right, how do we subscribe and what do we get? CBSSports.com slash newsletters. You'll get eight editions of the Fantasy Football Today newsletter in your mailbox every single day of the week except for Saturday. 
twice a day on Sunday and Wednesday. You'll get my reactions to all the games on Monday morning. You'll get Jamie's waiver wires. You'll get all of Heath's columns, Dave's position or weekly previews. You get all this stuff sent right to you along with unique analysis that you won't find anywhere else. Um, and it's the only place to find my rankings. So it's a fantasy football today newsletter. Subscribe. What about my sports.com slash newsletters? Can we have like my movie takes or maybe a, if you want to send me that once a week, real. I can, I can drop that in the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, you give me some random category. I'll give you a top three every week, and people could just hate me for it. All right, news and notes: Christian McCaffrey still not going on IR. IR would mean he'd have to miss three games. Mm-hmm. So that's obviously not including last week. So it could be, could be one, could be two. Who knows? Maybe he'll end up on IR. But you got to pick up Chuba Hubbard just in case. Yep. At Dallas next week, then Philadelphia, then Minnesota. Andy Dalton is week to week. And some injuries that we're not going to cover necessarily the big ones because we don't have updated information unless you saw anything on AJ Brown. But no, I haven't seen anything. Yeah, we haven't gotten much on uh, much big news, but just some other ones to keep an eye on that won't get a lot of publicity. Arizona left guard Justin Pugh and his backup both left with injuries. Baltimore safety to Sean Elliott left with an injury. They're at Denver next week. Uh, the Steelers did not record a sack for the first time in 76 games. They had the longest streak in football, 75 straight games. That uh, went out the window in that I think loss. They were missing TJ Watt. <laughs> they were missing TJ Watt. And not a ton of dropbacks for Dalton, but still no. sacks. Uh, Burrow. Uh, yeah, sorry, Burrow. Uh, two Pittsburgh offensive linemen actually left with injuries in the second half. Bad to worse. That offense looks completely broken. Mm hmm. Cincinnati, uh, Devonta Adams almost had as many targets as Najee Harris, by the way. So yeah, yeah. Cincinnati cornerback Shadobi Awuzie left with an injury. They probably won't need him next week against Jacksonville or this week, whatever. Next week, we'll say. Two Colts cornerbacks got hurt. They're at Miami next week. Rocky Sin and Kari Willis. They left with injuries. This is a bigger one. Uh, New Orleans left tackle Teron Armstead is going to miss some time. So they're going to mm-hmm. be without their starting set. I don't know when McCoy is coming back. They didn't put him on IR. But they could be without their starting center, starting left tackle. They're beat up. And they get the Giants, who are also beat up, because Giants, uh, maybe best defensive player, Blake Martinez, is out for the year with a torn ACL. KJ Hamler tore his ACL. Sterling Shepard likely likely to miss some time, according to ESPN, with a hamstring injury. By the way, for IDP leagues, keep an eye on Tay Crowder. He got more playing time, um, or at least more tackles, with uh, Blake Martinez leaving the game, and he had 11 total tackles. Seven of them were assisted. I thought he was with the Jazz. Yeah, he he's he moonlights as a linebacker. Sons, excuse me. Oh, wow. Oh, man. I, th- I expect more from you. I uh, disappointed myself. San Francisco very beat up at cornerback as they faced the Seahawks. They had two or, I think, two or three more injuries at cornerback last night. This team just cannot stay healthy. They, they got to, like, Hire a new trainer. I don't know. Figure something out. I don't know what's going on there. Yeah. And Carolina acquired cornerback CJ Henderson and a fifth round pick from the Jacksonville Jaguars for tight end Dan Arnold and a third round pick. Uh, they're being aggressive. And that was a that was a top 10 pick in the NFL draft, CJ Henderson. And they got basically a third rounder for him. So it's going to be a real bad look for Urban Meyer if uh, CJ Henderson ends up being really good for the Panthers because that seems like it was a poison situation pretty much all off season. And I don't know. It's hard yeah. to, hard to, hard to feel confident in it. Not good. Hey, let's bring on Jacob Gibbs. Now, Jacob Gibbs chilling, re- uh, rehabbing the back injury. I just want to tell everybody that in case they aren't aware and they see you like lounging, he's not lazy. He's just, <laughs> he's got a broken back and yet he's still there. carrying the team. How you doing, man? Good. I mean, my Chiefs lost again. Uh, that was the last thing I talked to you about. Was I know on FFT and five, so not not so great. But excited to talk about some football. But what did we say? We said, hey, they better step up because Mike Williams is right. going to have a big That's day. That's true. Yeah, he <laughs> sure did. Uh, and listen, I, we're just talking, just three dudes talking football. I think it's pretty obvious that if you give a team with at least a decent offense the ball in the two minute drill. <laughs> And all they have to do is get in a field goal range. They're gonna kick the field goal. Well, this is they're gonna win. The Dolphins, like the Chargers, knew that they played for the touchdown. The Dolphins played for the field goal. They should have gone for it. 
They lost the game in overtime there. Maybe they would have maybe they would have gotten stopped on fourth down and lost anyway. But you give that ball back to Derek Carr, you're going to lose. They're going to kick yeah. the field. It's too easy. And kickers are too good these days. I'm not talking mm-hmm. about the Niners because 37 seconds, it wasn't their fault. You know, uh, It's not like uh, you're going to tell Juszczyk, no, don't get in the end zone or anything. Yeah, like but, There was, the, there was the one play where they snapped the ball with 12 seconds left on the play clock. That's the only possible criticism you can make of it, I think. Yeah, but they were obviously trying to bleed some, some clock there. The Dolphins should have gone unconventional and said, no, we're going for this. We got to go for the win here. Teams have to realize it's too damn easy to kick that field goal. It happens way too often. All right. Anyway, first big topic. I, Dustin says, I need some discussion on wide receivers who are underwhelming to start the season. Woods and Allen Robinson are on my roster. It's incredibly hard not to start them each week by nature of who they are. What do we do? So, Jacob, I'll give you the first word. First of all, any wide receivers that you want to talk about struggling uh, Woods and Robinson suggested, but the floor is yours. I don't want to talk about any of these guys because it's it's too relatable. I've got Woods on my team. I've got <laughs> AJ Brown on all my teams. I've got Calvin Ridley everywhere. Uh, it's been it's been rough out here for for some of these uh, early and mid round wide receivers. I'm not particularly concerned about any of the names we've hit on, um, with maybe Allen Robinson being the one exception, just because that situation seems to be a little bit out of his control. Um, I guess Calvin Ridley, I think, is worth bringing up as well, um, just because what we've seen from Atlanta is really, really bizarre. Um, I don't know if you guys have talked about this much at all, but like <laughs> we talked about it at the very beginning of the show. Oh, really? Okay. Well, well, briefly. Then... Oh, and it's and we talked about it yesterday on the recap too. And I watched the whole game. I mean, it's just they are still one of I don't know. Maybe the Dolphins had one going into the game. They were one of four teams that didn't have a forty-yard pass play, and they still have not had one. And that is just yes. shocking to see from from the Falcons. Yeah. Matt Ryan, 1.7% of his attempts have gone 20 or more yards, which he's the like, other than Andy Dalton, he's like by far the lowest in the league in terms of all sorts of aggressiveness um, metrics. It's, it's really insane. I mean, his average depth of target is 4.2 yards. I, and so it's just like killing all of the downfield weapons there. He's just throwing it to the running backs over and over. Um, so if that, if that doesn't change, that's definitely not good news for, for Ridley. Um, and it, Ridley, to be clear, this wasn't like an ongoing issue. Last season, Ridley played 15 games and led the NFL in air yards, and right. it wasn't close. Yeah, He had 2,052 air yards. DK Metcalf had 1,768 as mm-hmm. in second place. So even when Julio Jones was out, they were targeting him down the field aggressively. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I remember even that, like, that one game where he didn't have a catch but had five targets. There were some downfield throws in that game as well, and he was dealing with an injury. So it's just been a dramatic shift in the offensive philosophy. Oh, yeah. that The good thing for him, for Ridley, is that he's going to lead the team in targets. Mm-hmm. Not like he's been completely horrible. He's not... You don't sit Calvin Ridley. I mean, maybe no. you just don't treat him as a number one, but he's still going to start. He has, I guess, kind of a high floor, um, but that ceiling of being potentially, you know, the top wide receiver, it just doesn't even look possible unless they change things around. Uh, Robinson, on the other hand, I mean... How could you not be worried about Allen Robinson? He's, I don't know. My issue with him is he's just so reliant on getting heavily targeted. He doesn't make a lot of big plays. He hasn't been a big yards per target guy. And people just assume Justin Fields is going to be a huge upgrade when that might happen, but it's not going to happen for a little while. I don't think if it does happen at all, I, I do think that you have to wonder if you're starting or sitting him. I get, they have Detroit this week, so people are probably going to go back to him, Mm -hmm. but um, you know, it's been very troubling. Chris, is he a, is he still a must start, or is he someone that you could look for other options with Allen Robinson? No, I, I don't think he's a must start. That's not to say that I think you should definitely sit him, but you know I, I've got some leagues where I probably will be sitting him this week, and I probably should have sat him uh, in week three. You know I, I've got him in one league where I had uh, James Robinson, Emmanuel Sanders, and Miles Gaskin on the bench. I don't know if I'm going to start Emmanuel Sanders over him next week. I might. And I think I'm going to start James Robinson over him. So it, it's not an Allen Robinson problem. Like, like Jacob said earlier, it's, it's a problem with this offense. I mean, the, the, the lack of creativity in the play calling yesterday was stunning, given the fact that they were starting Justin Fields. I don't know if they wanted to keep it simple for his first game, but that's the opposite of what you should do. You should be trying to take advantage of what Justin Fields does and does well, which is move and make plays on the move. 
There were very few uh, RPOs in this game. There were very few uh, option runs in this game. And if you're not using Justin Fields that way, and this is kind of a an ongoing issue with Matt Nagy because the best period of Mitchell Trubisky's career was that period in, God, are we going back to 2019, 2018 at this point with that? Yeah. Uh, when he was rushing a lot in the t- kind of middle part of the 2018 season and he was really making a lot of plays with his legs and they just never went back to it. And I always assumed maybe it was just because Trubisky's run kind of ended with that shoulder injury that season. But this was a troubling, troubling game for my David Montgomery and Allen Robinson shares moving forward. Do we all think Woods is going to be fine? I I mean, Woods, I I don't really know what to make of it. It's like the the Rams offense has been you know, pretty good and, They've got six pass plays of over 40 yards, and I think Robert Woods' longest catch is 20. Everybody's getting, everybody's making big plays except for him. Uh, only two wide receivers have been targeted in the red zone, and it's Cup has seven and Woods has four, so at least he's getting those types of targets. I, I mean, I, people are probably losing faith. I, I think Woods is a great buy low. I'm sorry, I just cannot see this continuing. I think there are going to be a lot of good games for him. Does anybody disagree with that? No, like before the season, the the reason the case for Robert Woods optimism was one, we still think he's going to be among the lead, the target leaders on that team. If not, you know, the number one, certainly the number two. And that's been the case this season. The other part was we thought Matthew Stafford would be more aggressive throwing the ball down the field and it would lead to higher value targets for Robert Woods. And so far, uh, Robert Woods average depth of target is up to 9.32, which is higher than it was last year by about three yards. So the case for him has mostly been correct, except that him and Matt Stafford just can't get on the same page. And I think you just have to trust that Robert Woods is a great receiver. Matthew Stafford is a good quarterback and that they're going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I do not agree with all that. I, for one thing, I thought the Rams were going to be more pass heavy than we've seen, especially with Henderson going down their pass rate in uh, neutral situations below 60%. Um, and how many times did they give Michelle the ball yesterday against Tampa Bay? Like that, I, I don't know. That surprised me a little bit. Um, and yeah. it definitely isn't helping Woods, but his rate stats are really not that bad. Um, and I'm glad to say dots up like Chris 20 said. Carries. 20 carries. Yeah, 20 carries. I thought it was over 20. It's I bet crazy. a lot were in the fourth quarter, though. Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's the thing with their, they keep, I mean, for, I know week one, week two was a close game. Uh, but week one, they had not, Daryl Henderson, I think, had nine carries in the fourth quarter and they ran. They ran 110 plays in their first two games. This time, finally, he had Stafford throw 38 times, and they probably ran a lot of plays in this game. 34-24 win over the Bucs. Um, all right, what, anyone else, uh, Jacob, anyone bothering? Like, Stefan Diggs is off to a slow start. I know we're, we all seem to be a little concerned about the targets for DeAndre Hopkins. It's just way too evenly divided between mm-hmm. everyone. <laughs> Uh, anyone jump out of you, Jacob, anyone that you're concerned about? We mentioned Ridley, but anyone else? No, no one else. The, the only thing I would, I just wanted to add to Ridley real quick was he is still seeing him just massive, uh, percentage of the air yards. He's at 49%, which is the third highest in the NFL right now. Devonta Smith is ahead of him currently and will probably drop after tonight's game. So probably the second highest. Um, so like if they just revert back to what we've seen from them in the past, where they're throwing downfield more often than with that rate stat, like we could see, the air yards we had seen in the past. That's the only real sign for optimism for him is it's not, it's kind of like Robinson. It's not his, it's nothing about Kevin Ridley or what he's doing. It's just all about right. the team. Yep. Uh, I want to mention with Diggs, if you're all concerned, he, his target share is down a little bit, but it's still 24.2%. His yards per target is a career low. His catch rate is a career low. That's not going to continue. And he's no, getting I- 10 targets per game. I mean, yeah, He's not worried about Diggs at all. Dead. Josh Allen just didn't play well the first two games, and then Diggs wasn't the guy who had a big game during Josh Allen's big game, which right. I don't think that's a reason to be concerned moving forward. <clears throat> no, targets are there. Production will come. All right, uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're, we've got a Miles Gaskin question, a Kenny Galladay question, two of the best teams in the NFL. Um, that's coming up next. You know, Dolphins aren't bad. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't include them. Well, that's coming up next on Fantasy Football Today. Welcome back, everybody. The Dolphins are pretty bad. Ah, <laughs> uh, with Brissett, but they had look. It's a good, it's not a bad like they got. They're not the Bills, right? We know that, but they beat the Patriots on the road. They almost beat the Raiders on the road with their backup quarterback. Yeah, they're they're pretty bad. 
I feel confident in saying that. You and I will watch the Giants Dolphins game together this year. Oh, oh my gosh. beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Chiefs, by the way, one game better than the Giants. How about that? <laughs> Carl Clockers says, Miles Gaskin, what to do? Chris, Miles Gaskin, what to do? You know, I grouped Miles Gaskin and Mike Davis kind of in my head coming into the season as guys who you know, really the main argument for them, nobody really thinks either of them is all that great of a player. So the main argument for them was that they were going to dominate touches in their respective backfields and be fantasy relevant due to volume mostly. And that hasn't been the case for either of them. And I think they're kind of in similar situations. Gaskin last season had at least 65% of the snaps in all 10 games he played this season. He hasn't gotten above 61%. Uh, He's still the leading back, but it's more like he's getting 60% of the carries and you know i think it's like 70 percent of the targets so that's still pretty good but i don't have a lot of confidence in him being much more than you know the 15th to 20th ranked running back most weeks gibbsy i am super bummed about what we've seen from gaskin particularly this week um they gave all the two minute work to malcolm brown this week uh, 15 of 22 which is a really massive sample size no other team had more two-minute offensive snaps in the Dolphins this week. And uh, 15 of 22 of those snaps went to Brown. Only four went to Gaskin. Uh, also, Brown got all of the work in the red zone. And on the year now, uh, he's played 86% of the snaps inside of the 10-yard line, Malcolm Brown. Uh, Miles hmm. Gaskin has zero. Um, huh. Gaskin's only played 33% of the red zone snaps um, through three games. So it... it if he's losing receiving work and red zone work, then he's left as what, like an early down back with league average efficiency on a below average offense. That's not really even someone you want in fantasy. Um, yeah. Again, I'm really bummed. I, I was a big Gaskin fan. I thought the usage was going to be there, but like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I trust these, this week's numbers though, either really. Like, I don't know if that's going to continue yeah. before that. It hadn't been that bad. Gaskin had been, playing more on the two minute drill and stuff but well one question i would have on that actually because i think i may have heard a little bit of insight on that okay uh, from the broadcast so malcolm brown actually started Mm -hmm. this game and charles davis who was calling the game for cbs suggested it may have something something to do with pass protection it was just a guess on his part but you know that they're in the meetings and whatnot but um then i didn't real i didn't know the two minute drill stats when you combine that conjecture with the two minute drill Maybe you've got something there. Before the yeah. season started, Brian Flores said Gaskin had gotten a lot better in pass protection. But if Malcolm Brown is really um, a big upgrade there, then that that could be uh, something that sticks. Yeah. So Malcolm Brown was out there on 22 pass plays. He ran 11 routes. So half the time that he was in on pass plays, uh, he was blocking. Mm-hmm. Whereas Gaskin was out there on 24, 29 pass plays and ran a route on. 24 of them so i think he's that still being targeted at a really high rate yeah when he's out there yeah he's got four catches a game you know he's averaging more yards per carry than per catch <laughs> 5.1 yards per carry 4.8 yards per catch but yeah uh, i i talk a lot about big plays explosive plays and i think i care about it more than almost anyone but miles gaskin is the reason why because if you're just if you're not getting that many carries you yeah. got to at least have the ability to break one and he is rarely going to do that. And that's what kind of, it's, me out. It, it's, it's like the, the idea of the high value touches that Ben Gretsch talked a lot about where, you know, you want targets, you want cares inside of the 10, because if you don't, then you have, you are very reliant on big plays. And some guys can do that. Saquon yeah. Barkley, historically, Derek Henry gets a ton of big plays, relatively speaking. Um, it's just, I think miles Gaskin's just a guy. Jacob, do you and have so a house you, phone? No, that that is mean. the the uh, someone needs to get someone's trying to get into the building uh, in my apartment. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. All right. Bad timing. Crazy. <laughs> the house phone is your first guess. What year is it? I was so surprised. <laughs> uh, so yeah, like that's that's the thing is like with Miles Gaskin and Mike Davis. Like I said earlier, like I I think they're pretty middling talents. I think they're kind of just guys. At, they do some things well, but I, I don't think either of them's necessarily a special player. And so if they're not dominating touches and especially those high value touches and neither one of them is, then you're looking at a pretty replaceable fantasy option. Mm-hmm. Dolphins also have the fourth lowest scoring offense in the NFL. Hopefully that changes. As it certainly doesn't help. 
Uh, all right, so we'll finish it off. Miles Gaskin or Chase Edmonds? Who would you rather have? I'd rather have Edmonds. Yeah, I think there might be more upside with Gaskin if he gets the role we saw last year, but I definitely would rather yep. have Edmonds. Uh, Miles Gaskin or <sighs> Damian Harris? PPR. Mm. Damian Harris got pinched for Brandon Bolden this week. Have mm. you seen the snaps and everything there? Brandon Bolden led the team in snaps. Yep. Yep. That's crazy. Well, they were trailing the whole game, basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the problem with Damian Harris is he's game script dependent. If they're right. going to throw 51 times, he's going to have a bad fantasy game. Um, How do you think they're going to do against the Bucs? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they really, they're one and two. They might not be good this year. Um, yeah. So that could that shouldn't be that surprising. Players. They weren't that good last year. Yeah, but um, they were, I mean, they were around 500. They weren't bad. Yeah. I don't remember what their record was. But yeah, I, I think I would probably go with Gaskin. I'm sure I'll have him ranked higher most weeks. Okay. Uh, next question is from Christian. Is Kenny Galladay outside of flex range since the Giants hate scoring touchdowns? I mean, I don't think it's a, I don't think they, they hate scoring touchdowns. Oh, I think it's it. just, um, you know, it, it's like, I don't hate losing weight. I just don't do it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's um, true. If you don't, I'm just not, I'm just not good at the things well. that go. I'm just not good at the things that go into losing weight. I think is the <laughs> the analogy to continue it. Um, yeah, you suck in the red zone when it comes to losing weight. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's always been a guy who needs to rely on you know really really good efficiency, and that hasn't been there for him so far. But how much of that is just that he hasn't been a hundred percent healthy? You know, he was limited in his snaps yesterday because of the hip. They were pulling him in and out of the lineup. You know, maybe he just needs some time to get right, but you can't feel confident starting him right now. But I do think touchdowns will come. I feel confident in Galladay as a flex with Sterling Shepard out, and especially if Darius, Darius Slayton is out as well. Uh, you, know, you know, he drew a pass interference in the end zone, so that was an end zone target that he got, not officially a target. And, yeah, that's he was played 69% of the snaps. So if he continues to get healthier, I think that's going to be much better. He'll lead the team in targets, I would assume, most weeks as long as Shepard is out. Um, mm -hmm. Daniel Jones is actually, I mean, all of the numbers so far, and it's not not adjusted for opponents or whatever, but he's been basically league average. He's been a lot better than he yeah. ever has. So um, that's encouraging. I think he's I think he's exactly that. I think he's a flex. I'm not willing to i i was a boomer bust point and not anymore yeah boomer bust flex you know like like brandon cooks has been for a lot of his career that that kind of guy you're hoping for a big play yeah okay uh and anything to add jacob or shall we move on one thing i would add is he has like one of the deepest route depths the average route depth of like any player in the nfl it's 12 yards last week and that's been where it's been every single week and Daniel Jones just typically doesn't like targeting guys like that. Um, definitely not at a high rate. And we saw like last week, as soon as Shepard went down, Colin Johnson came in, Evan Ingram, those guys were the ones he was targeting over and over and over as their short yardage guys. And it was something I was, I, it's, I was really, really down on Galladay coming into the year for, this was one of the reasons is like Jones has just never shown a tendency to, to target those guys downfield and Slade never once in a while. Um, he is throwing downfield a little bit more this year, but ultimately his, uh, his the amount of attempts that have gone twenty plus yards is still not high. It's actually the lowest it's been in any of his three years. Mm. Um, so I don't know. I, I think he'll have flex value, but I think his targets are just going to be capped by the way they're using him. He's it, it truly is like higher than any receiver in the NFL in terms yeah. of uh, how far deep down the field his routes are developing. That's pretty typical, you know. Yeah. Deep deep threat guys, guys who primarily work down the field, they tend to get fewer targets. Um, Right. He's I, I'm going to have 20, I think. Right. And he still has had good years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's always been his thing, but he's at 8.7 yards per target this season. Whereas he'd been at like 10 to 11 the previous couple of years. I'm going to have Evan Ingram ranked embarrassingly high this week of Sterling Shepard's out. And I'm not going to feel good about it. <laughs> you shouldn't <laughs> uh, giants at new Orleans this week. Okay. we that was our Kenny Galladay discussion. Let's go on to Randy Mallow four. What major takes going into week one have changed and which ones should we remain patient on? Hmm. What's changed since week one? I mean, obviously, Justin Fields, I think, is a just the rookie quarterbacks in general. Like, there's just they've all been bad and yeah. they're fantasy poison. I don't know if you could say that about Lawrence. I'm not sure that they'd be better with a backup or anything like that, but they're fantasy poison for the most part. Uh, so that's one thing that's changed. Um, I think when you look, well, go ahead. I'll let you guys speak. Go ahead. Sorry. 
I think the Atlanta situation we've talked about, if that doesn't change quickly, then like the upside for Ridley and Pitts is severely capped. In the mm-hmm. same way, if we don't like quickly see changes in Cincinnati, then I think the upside for those pass catchers is is a lot more capped than people realize. Uh, you might consider trading somebody like Jamar Chase, um, give him the hot start because like they're talk about pass rates. I think they're like in the bottom three in situation neutral pass rates. Um, and the narrative has been that they're easing Joe Burrow in, um, but it hasn't changed yet, like even a little bit yeah. um, in a single week. And so the longer that goes on, the more concerned you get that like, this is just what we're getting. And Joe Mixon is just going to get slammed into the line 20 times a game. And none of these receivers are going to be that relevant on a week to week basis. Um, one thing I was big to yeah. this guy. It's one the- thing I'm close to changing my opinion on uh, is Joe Mixon and his upside. No. I loved the fact that he got four targets in week one. I love the fact that he you know, played most of the passing downs in that game. But we saw Chris Evans come in on a handful of yeah. third downs. I think there were eight third down plays yesterday. Evans played or nine. Evans played five. Mixon played three. And so if he's back to not having a, a real third down role, I think that's going to limit his upside just like it you know, has in the past. And that's really frustrating because I have a lot of Joe Mixon and I was very, very confident that he was going to get more involvement in the work, the passing game. So that's a bit of concern. Um, I've gone from thinking Ben Roethlisberger was finished (laughs) to being absolutely confident with every fiber of my being. He looks like the worst quarterback in the NFL right now. Um, No, that's what I said yesterday. Then I said, no, Zach, Zach Wilson right now (sighs) is worse. Man, Ben Roethlisberger's situation's a lot better. It doesn't um, matter. I mean, you, if you had one game to win, right? Right. Now, the uh, the I, I think the the like Steelers offense in miniature was captured on that fourth and ten play to end the what, game. What the hell was that? Well, you can <laughs> see what they were going for. You can see what they were going for, which was they they had three receivers on the right side, two wide receivers, and and Frymouth the tight end. They all ran like posts or goes to draw the defense into the end zone because fourth and 10 from the 11. So you figure yeah. you got to go for the end zone. Uh, and the, the idea was you draw that, you draw the defense out and you get Najee Harris into a situation where he just has to beat one guy, a linebacker. The problem is I, I pulled out the stopwatch yesterday and it was 1.19 seconds from the time the ball was snapped to the time Ben Roethlisberger made the decision to throw. That's not nearly enough time to allow those plays to develop. Well, so I, one think that was, I was listening to the broadcast too. I think what they said was the Steelers were expecting a blitz and the yeah. Bengals faked the blitz basically. And then would have been a good, play, maybe would have been a decent play call if they had blitzed and they didn't. And by the way, when you said pulled out the stopwatch, that was on your iPhone or you had an actual stopwatch? Yeah, the, uh, the stopwatch app. On my yeah, okay. that's, I was uh, just laughing at the idea of Chris at home with his stopwatch uh, rewinding uh, it. It's but yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's bad. Ben Roethlisberger doesn't want to throw the ball downfield. He's not good at it. Um, they can't block anyone. Uh, Najee Harris is going to be a top 12 running back by default, but I'm, and Deontay Johnson, I guess will be a must start wide receiver when he's healthy. I don't feel good about anyone else. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that one, uh, here, what else, what else have I, have I changed my opinion on Sam Darnold? He's pretty good, or at yeah. the very least, the situation's good Nothing. enough for him to for him to to be fine. I don't think he's going to be a fantasy starter uh, consistently, but I feel pretty good about that offense. It's not going to be the disaster we might have thought it we thought it might be if Darnold didn't you know take a step forward. All right, last one from Rocky Corey, Tyreek Hill. How close is the panic button on Tyreek Hill? A thousand miles away. Guys, we didn't get the second part of that guy's question. I was like excited to actually be positive about someone and said, I feel like all day we've been talking about negative stuff. Miles Gaskin, these receivers. All right, fine. Hey, I was positive about Sam Donald. <laughs> Who are you positive That's about? Uh, I think Odo Beckham. I thought what we saw last week was yeah. really, really exciting. And it, he didn't have a huge fantasy day. Um, so, like, maybe you're a little bit wary as his owner. You know, you haven't got much yet through three weeks in terms of production. But he had a 31% target share and a 49% mm-hmm. air yard share. Like, that's great. If he can get that on a weekly basis, like he's, you're going to be good to go. That's a top 25 receiver for sure. Yeah. Um, played 47 of 57 snaps before the fourth quarter, led yeah. the team with 34 routes run on 40 pass plays. Um, I, he had a much bigger role than I thought he would. 
Yeah, I think stay patient with him. And then the other guy is stay patient with Mark Andrews. I think uh, we've talked about this, but like yeah. his route involvement is better than any tight end in terms of the amount of uh, routes he's running in ter- like compared to drop X. And we finally saw him be targeted last week, similar to what we've seen in the past. Um, and it still hasn't, you know, didn't sc- find the end zone. Um, but if, if this continues, like he's definitely a top three tight end. Um, so stay patient with him as well. Also, yeah. I know Marquise Brown had a bunch of drops yesterday, but <laughs> Man, he was like fingers away from a just truly massive game. He probably he dropped at least two and maybe three touchdowns in this game. Yeah. So as long as they keep using him the way they are, uh, I think Marquise Brown is going to be a a solid starting fantasy option most weeks. Mm-hmm. Now we'd be talking about him kind of like Mike Williams if he had had the game that he should have had. We'd be talking about him as one of the best uh, draft picks. Mike Williams, I think, right now is. My candidate to be the fantasy MVP, basically, be the best value in drafts. Uh, yeah. All right, finally, Rocky Corey asks, "How close are we to the panic button?" Chris said, "Not a thousand miles away, or something like that." Um, yep. uh, Jacob, any concerns about Tyreek Hill? No, definitely not. Um, I've watched the last two games as a Chiefs fan, and it's you see this happen intermittently throughout the season where teams are just like, "We're not letting Tyreek beat us." They've got people matched on man to man everywhere, no matter what scheme they're playing, and they've got too deep almost every single play it's just they're just making you beat them with other guys um and what will happen is kelsey will rat off a couple of big games and then he'll get that treatment and then tyreek will start playing well again i'm not worried about it yeah travis kelsey's currently the number three wide receiver so <laughs> you know i think that kind of tells you like there's there's no reason to think that offense isn't what we hoped it would be there's no reason to think uh that that passing game won't be what we hoped it would be and you know kelsey will slow down a little like jacob said and Tyreek will heat up or they'll just both be awesome. Like, like last year. Well, one thing that we're seeing though, is teams are blitzing the chiefs uh, less frequently. The last mm-hmm. three teams to beat the chiefs. I saw this, uh, I think in the athletic today, or actually it was published last week. The last three teams to beat the chiefs before the chargers did blitz them five times or fewer. That included the bucks in the super bowl. Uh, and then what did they, what did we nine blitzes last uh, on Sunday for the chargers? I think so. I think it was only 20% was the final rate I saw. So they're playing very deep. They're not letting Tyreek Hill beat them, and they're not blitzing. And we'll see. Like, Yeah, look, this. I remember the Bills game last year. The Bills kind of did the same thing. They just said, all right, we're not going to let you run the ball. And they had 26 carries for Clyde Edwards-Eler in that game. And Mahomes had a pretty crummy game because he only threw – oh, uh, he threw – 26 times, same amount as uh, Clyde Edwards Eler had in carries. Tyreek Hill had three targets, three catches for 20 yards. They figured things out after that. Then they went absolutely berserk. And, if it was yeah. if it was easy to stop the Chiefs, yeah, exactly. It would be easy, you know. Like people would do it more than three times a year or whatever it ends up being. Like there, there's like, and this is a similar stretch. Tyreek Hill had three catches for 20 yards in that Buffalo game. He only had 55 yards on six catches the next week. The only difference is. He scored a touchdown in that game. He didn't yesterday. Yeah. Uh, then he had at least 98 in four straight games, including 269 yards in week 12. So, yes, it only takes one time with Tyree Kill getting past the defense for him to turn that completely around. Mm-hmm. One time. It's like the like, uh, the Danny O'Shea speech. Like, at like beating Kevin O'Shea down yes. Terry yes. Hill. That's what I say. Yes. Good job. All right. Giants, Giants. There we go. The only good ones. The only good Giants. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much. I, by the way, I found out. Wow. Little. I can't in- believe I got the. It was actually Cherry Hill in the movie. I can't believe I got that reference right. I'm so I proud of myself. That. I have no idea what you guys are talking about. Little Giants. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I found out insider information. Scott Hansen of NFL Red Zone has never seen Little Giants. Wow. wow. Yeah, I know. Because I, I know this because Adam Rank of NFL Network has never seen Little Giants, and I uh, we got into this whole Twitter thing about it, and I said, make sure Adam Rank watch, watches Little Giants, and he said, I've never seen it. So wow. it. <laughs> confess that to me. And I was going to go to the papers about this, but I said, no. Like, I said, well, now, like, now you reported it on one of the <laughs> yeah. most widely listened to fantasy football podcasts in the world. It's on YouTube now. It's uh, Way to keep the secret. <laughs> yeah. It's out there. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, for watching and listening. We'll talk to you tomorrow with the waiver wire.